Our first scripture reading is from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. The second Advent reading is from Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his Son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Good morning, church. I like to see everybody's face, but it's not possible. I try to glance as much as possible. Yeah, good to see you all. Thank you for coming today and uh, encouraging me to preach. And for those of you who are not regular at High Point, my name is Manohar. I'm one of the ministers at High Point. And uh, uh, before I get into the Word, I really uh, want to talk about my trip to India. I was in India for two months, October and November, uh, uh, traveling to four different states and uh, preaching the gospel, encouraging the believers, especially training more than 1,000 pastors through seven seminars that we organized. And it was a great blessing. And some of these places that I've been to, people travel by those kind of things behind there. It's very dangerous to stand. But people came by mopeds, bicycles, um, trains, auto rickshaw, and different places. And some of those places, some of these pastors never heard what is vision, whether they should have a vision for church. And that is the need of Indian church today. And then I was able to even uh, teach, not from the stage kind of settings, you know, sit at the center like Jewish rabbi and then try to uh, encourage them to be uh, effective leaders in their church and uh, reach the world um, effectively. So these are some of those pictures. And also, uh, I inaugurated some of the new church plants when I was there. Look at that church. It's a very like, small hut. That is how the churches look like. And uh, uh, they asked whether I would go there to inaugurate. I said, of course, I would love those kind of things. That's how I started my ministry there. And then those believers do not have even Bible in their hands. So we went with Bibles, and then we gave them Bibles there. And I also inspected uh, uh, some of the churches that we have been building for the poverty-stricken congregations. Um, we sponsored financially those churches, but I just wanted to go, and not as an inspector, but go as an encouragement and rejoice with them. So that was a blessing for me as well. And then God gave us two full-time staff in one of the states that uh, we run our Redeem India office. And finally, I want to tell you, God blessed us with a small piece of land that we have been praying for 10 years. And uh, this is not a big place, but it's like a quarter of an acre, um, and we built a wall around it and put a gate, and that's all we could do with the money we had. But again, uh, we had to take a loan, and only 35% of the total need is met so far, and pray for the uh, rest of the financial need to be met. Right? The reason I'm saying all these things, not to come and, you know, force you to give, no. I just say that you have already been blessing India. 
You have already been touching India with your prayers and support. So I just came here to say thank you for standing with me and standing with the nation that needs gospel. So, and they, yeah, probably you should applaud to your, for yourself. Thank you. Now let us get to the word of God. Coming to the text that we read today from Luke chapter two. We find Mary at the end of her pregnancy trying to take a journey to Nazareth, I mean to Bethlehem in Judea from Nazareth in Galilee. We have no record in the Bible that they called Uber and asked for a donkey. <laughs> no. But that's how it has been portrayed in the movies and other places. But we have no idea that they even travel. But what I know is a woman fully pregnant, nine month pregnant, trying to travel with Joseph 90 kilometers. It's a painful journey, right? Now, why they have to travel or why they have to take risk of traveling with such a pregnant woman all the way 90 miles? And they were not going there for delivery, although it happened there. They were going there to fulfill an imperial command of Caesar Augustus who wanted to take census of people. So Mary and Joseph probably had a piece of land there and they had to return by this imperial command, otherwise they might lose some of their native privileges or they may get punished for not participating in the census. And we all know census taking is so important part of every government because it helps in national development planning. If nation wants to plan for any sort of development, census would help. But on the flip side, census is all about power and control. And more so in the ancient world. Because the kingdom of the world operates on the principles of worldliness. So in the early centuries, the more the emperors conducted census, the more they were tempted to classify people as to who they wanted to tax more, who they wanted to oppress more, who they wanted to control more to secure their power and expand their kingdom. And think about Zacchaeus in the scriptures, who was the chief of tax collectors, and he knows how to gather money as much as he wanted. And Augustus Caesar loved taking census so that he could expand his kingdom beyond what he had that moment of time, and Rome was almost doubled during his time. Now, in the Bible, Senses are considered both sacred as well as dangerous. And Numbers chapters 1, 4, and 26, God himself commanded Moses to go and take census of the priestly people and also census of the male who are eligible for military. But in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we see God punishing David for attempting to take census of his own military. Why would God do that? Because David had this intention of really developing his own nation. And David was a man after God's own heart. The answer is simple. David wanted to protect the nation with his own strength instead of God. So God did not like that. David wanted to employ a human strategy probably to prove that he is capable like Saul. But God did not like that. Let me tell you what is God's problem. God's problem is that he does not share his glory with anyone. He does not. And if you attempt to steal his glory by any means, 
He does not like that. That's what happened. God comes down and smites the nation of Israel with the plague. Why? Because God really wanted to be their king. God chose the nation of Israel so that he could be their God, so that the whole world will know the power and the glory of God. For about a thousand years, Israel did not have a king. For about a thousand years, they did not have a blacksmith who could make swords, who could make weapons for them. God was fighting their battles and they never failed. Yet, at one point of time in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, the elders of Israel come to a prophet Samuel and ask him, come on, we wanted to look like everybody else. We wanted a physical king. Give us a king. We want to look like everybody else. And Samuel said, no, God is your king. What do you need? They said, no, 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 no. We wanted to look like everybody else. Then God gives reluctantly King Saul over them as a king. And then what happens? Saul began to build his own kingdom. Until that point of time, all the people of Israel were trying to call themselves as the army of the living God until Saul comes and then they have changed their language and they began to say, the armies of Saul. And they slowly begin to forget what God has done in their their own lives. And what did Saul do? He even undermined God's power and his glory and set up a monument for himself. Think about that. That is what the human kings do. And then God has to remove his kingdom and give it to David, who comes through this event called fighting in the valley of Elah, where he had to fight Goliath with just a sling. But all that happened was because he brought a, a spiritual language into the scene. He began to say, now who is this Philistine who fights against the armies of the living God? For about 40 Days and 40 nights, they were all afraid of just looking at Goliath. They were all afraid of hearing his voice. They were all afraid of his stature, nine feet tall. Until David comes in and changes their faith language from being Saul's army to the army of the living God. You know, sometimes we have that reverse language. Instead of being identified as a servant of God, minister of God, we always identify ourselves with the institutions. That is the danger. Everybody come in. Now David falls into the same trap of what Saul has fallen into. He had his own me doing it moment. And he wanted to count the military power. But you know, his commander Joab comes and he tells, may the Lord multiply your troops a hundred times. Why do you want to count your troops instead of counting on God? His commander comes to him and tells, you don't have to count and make a strategy for your military strength. God will fight for you. That is the language he was trying to say. But in 1 Corinthians First Chronicle chapter 21, verse 1, David listened to Satan's voice rather than God's voice. That's what happens to us. We always have Satan's voice on one side and God's voice on the other side, and we always heed to Satan's voice because that is sweet. That gives us pleasure. That gives us approval. When godliness rules government... God brings judgment on people. You know, God does not approve power-driven senses because it undermines God's sovereignty over his creation and his plan for the nation. He does not. Sometimes we try to count so many things out 
out of our own pride because you think, yeah, I did this one, I have achieved, I studied this, I, I did this this many years. Where is it coming from? That is what God is looking at. Or whether we are glorifying God through everything that God has done in our own lives. That means when authority operates on principles of worldliness, we care less about God and more about ourselves. Let me repeat that. When our authority operates on the principles of worldliness, we will care less about God and more about ourselves. Think about Herod. He grew up as a Jew. Probably he practiced Jewish religious practices, and of course I went to Herod's temple in Israel with a group of people from the church, and we saw some mikveh, means the ritual baths there. That means he appeared to be spiritual, and in, co- and, and in, in the course of time, he built or rebuilt the second temple in Jerusalem. Beautifully he rebuilt. But again, he did not build it to God or for God or to win the favor of God, but to win the favor of Jews so that he can stay in power. And in fact, he built the Jerusalem temple, but he never entered there, even to worship God. Pharisees and Sadducees hated him to death because he wanted to be worshipped as a god. To protect his throne, he was not afraid of killing his mother, his wife, his two children, and the members of Sanhedrin, and even the babies in Bethlehem. Think about where the worldliness will lead if we do not have a godly leaders in the government. That's why elections are very important, very, very important. And I'm glad you have so much, you know, you have so much really information to choose the good ones for, you know, the benefit of the nation. Second, when the worldliness in government operates on the principles of its own worldliness, it affects people on the margins, not the wealthy, not the powerful. When governments are ruled by worldliness, it is those people who are on the margins get affected, not the wealthy, not the powerful. Pharaoh is the best example. In Exodus chapter one, when Pharaoh heard the census report, that the Hebrews were growing in substantial numbers. He felt insecure, and he thought he's going to lose his kingdom. And as a result, he imposes all the available worldly strategies to suppress them. And they were hardworking citizens. They were loyal to his kingdom, yet he thought it is not wise for them to let him, let them grow and prosper. So he want, he began to, you know, push hard slavery on them. He began to persecute them and physically weaken them so that he can stay on the power forever. That was his dream. Look at how people on the margin are affected when senses are viewed from the wrong mindset. You know this fallen leader on the right? He wanted to expel all the Jews from his own nation because he couldn't bear the growth of Jewish communities and their wealth. For every wrong step he took, he blamed on Jews. And you know what happened to him? He did not care about their dignity or their right to equality. Think about the one world kingdom dreamers, Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, and Saddam Hussein. All of them went in the way of holiness to conquer the world. But you know what happened to them? And then you are just wondering, you know, what is it to us? You know, when our spirit of influence is operated on the principles of worldliness, we will not care about everyone's dignity. 
everyone's equality and their right to equality. We don't. And then now we think, yeah, I'm glad I'm not a senator. I'm glad I'm not a lawmaker. But you know, this happens on the local level too. Think about Mary who was in birth pains. She was in a place of hospitality, yet in did not make room for her because they had, pay, they had really good space for Roman paying customers instead of Mary. Mary was subject to treatment none of us would accept for our own daughter, mother, or even wife. Mary was not subject to any kind of respect, even as a young woman, and even her baby was attacked as a threat to the kingdom, even after faithfully obeying the imperial command to be in that place, they have to flee to Egypt as a refugee. You know, sometimes when we hear these stories, you know what we do? We think about me too moments. Yeah, I was like Mary. Yeah, I, I was like Mary. People did not treat me well. But you know, I want to tell you that instead of comparing with Mary, why don't we compare with the innkeeper? We should have innkeeper moments to remember and rectify because sometimes we always compare with the best person in the story and we will never bring a change in our own lives. Probably we had those moments of the innkeeper who doesn't care about the dignity of every person. You know, people in need deserve our compassion and hospitality, not judgment and rejection. You know that? That's what we do when we look at a person, we judge too much, and then ultimately we don't want to do anything. You know, Bible says, Matthew chapter 9, 35, and Mark chapter 6, when Jesus saw the crowds, what did he do? He had a compassion on them. He had compassion on them. Jesus had different eyes, and he had a different heart. And when the adulterous woman was dragged to Jesus by these Pharisees and demanded him to stone her to death according to the law of Moses, what did he do? He used his authority to save her life, forgive her sin rather than punish. And after her accusers left, Jesus went to the woman and asked, has no one condemned you? Has no one condemned you? Then she said, no, sir. Then Jesus says, neither do I go and sin no more. What a compassionate king that we have. The kingdom of God functions on the principles of love, freedom, righteousness, justice, joy, peace, forgiveness, and salvation. Not on military power. Not on security around the nation. Not about our own security of our children. It is all as a family of God. God's kingdom functions on these principles. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 to 8 which we read this morning. But when the right time came... God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us. Look here. God sent him to buy what? Freedom for us. Who were slaves to the law. So that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent his spirit sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call above Father. See, God gave us a direct access to God through Jesus Christ. So now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. Now, since you are his child, God has made you his heir. 
So Paul is talking about how God transforms our lives and our position in Jesus. If you don't experience this transformation and if you don't see your status in Jesus, that means something wrong with us, not something wrong with Jesus. So we had to find out where is our status here. And when Jesus came, his incarnation was an aggressive act of love. It is not an aggressive act of punishment for those who sin against him. God could have turned all mankind with an aggressive punishment, but he chose the other side of it. He chose an aggressive act of love by giving up his son to die on the cross for you and me. That is the gospel of the season. Unlike Herod, King Herod, who took the lives of the family, God gives his family to the world. The only son, Jesus Christ, who was a self-sacrificing agape. And Jesus' incarnation was a radical act of humility. This is another important thing. And there was no one who was a perfect example of humility in the world until Jesus had come. And again, Jesus did not come like any other king who has come on horses with worldly strategy, swords, spears, or military power, but as a vulnerable baby in a manger. But still, people felt threatened at this true king. Paul goes deeper in Philippians chapter, chapter 2, 6 to 8. This is what it reads there. Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Look at that. The humility that God takes on. He has to, because of his heavenly status, he is taking that for a purpose. He rather made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Again, he did not appear as a king but as a son of man. At least 40 times in the Gospels he said, I'm the son of man. Son of man comes in power. Son of man comes to save you. So he used 40 times, he wanted to identify with every humanity on earth, every tribe, every tongue, every culture, every language group. He wanted to say, I am the son of mankind. And he was humble enough to God's mission to the world till the point of death on the cross. You know, when Jesus was on earth, when his glory was uh, going up with the great following, people wanted to make him king, and he rejected the offer. Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, verse 20 tells us, the foxes have dens and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. He was a homeless king who cared about everyone's dignity. He not only gave them his own life so that they will have life in abundance, but he gave them hope of salvation. As Christians, do we set an example before the world through humility? Without humility, whatever we do, God will not be pleased. That is what he did to David when he wanted to count his military. He said, no, choose. I'm going to give you three punishments. Then he has to choose one of those. It was a hard lesson for him. Now, Jesus' incarnation was the greatest epitome of forgiveness. This is, a, this is something very important to know about the season, this time. Unlike, un, unlike 
you know, worldly, cruel leaders, Jesus came as an ordinary man with extraordinary grace to show mercy to the sinners and offer forgiveness rather than punishment. Look at that. So the precious gifts that Jesus brought for us from heaven are what? Love, joy, peace, freedom, and forgiveness. Well, in this giftive season, which is the most wonderful time of the year that we often call, probably businesses call, because they make billions of dollars. We show our love to the poor in our neighborhoods and around the world by stuffing shoeboxes, running the warm clothes drive, or uh, fighting hunger campaigns, what not. I'm all for those works of compassion But we also have to offer people the precious gifts that we received for life. Love, joy, peace, and forgiveness. You know, humans are imprisoned in many ways. Maybe they're all celebrating and coming and singing. Some of us are maybe singing here too. But there's a pain in their heart. There's an agony in their heart. And who is going to take care of those needs? Recently, a friend of mine sent me a text message saying, Manohar, I feel lonely. I said, brother, you have your family with you. You have your children with you. What's up? I don't know. I'm lonely. He's lonely while he's enjoying with the family. Literally, people are sometimes dying in their hearts, and none of us will be able to detect unless we have the same eyes as Jesus had to have compassion on them, go deeper than just giving a small gift in their hands. Maybe some people are looking for your pure love rather than a gift. Maybe some people are looking for your forgiveness rather than our brilliant analysis of justifying ourselves of the problem. All that they need is your forgiveness. Don't get away with gift giving in this season. And there may be so many people in your neighborhood who need to hear the good news so that they can share in the Christmas joy this season. We may be thinking that we are sending Cards are giving cards and they know gospel. No, you need to open your mouth and share your precious gift of joy, love, peace with them. You know, after the British left India, Mohan Das Gandhi, the great Hindu religious leader who, who actually championed freedom movement through nonviolence, he said, Christianity has not failed. It has never been tried. Because some of the Indians thought, finally, Christianity failed in India because, you know, they didn't know whether British was really Christian or not. But they all thought all white people belong to that Christianity kind of religion. But Gandhi was changed from being outside of the church while people inside the church did not change. In other words, Gandhi is saying, it has never been tried. It's not Christianity fail. It is people in Christianity that fail. Right? May the Lord prepare your hearts to allow Jesus to reign in your hearts to lighten your burdens. I don't know what kind of burden you have. You know, this season comes and goes. Sometimes this season is good for you because then you have a community. But there are so many people who do not have a community. For some people, it's a season of depression. A season of pain. You go with those unseen But visible to people when you go with true joy in your heart and peace that you can spread and the salvation that goes from Jesus when you share with them. 
You know, this is the first time in my history of preaching I'm closing early. But if you wanted to, if you wanted to really a prayer that you wanted to be used of the Lord. You can come here, we can pray together. Because this season is a season for us with Christmas trees and with uh, uh, gifts, uh, receiving gift giving, sending cards, sending family updates and all. But in the other side of the world, people are dying, you know that? People even are persecuted for being Christian. And some churches are at threat on Christmas Day because they will come and attack the churches. So it's not a joyful season for many of them from the worldly point of view. But they truly have those gifts to give to the world, the joy, peace, forgiveness, and salvation. And God is calling us to that gospel in this season. He has come so that we can have life and life in abundance. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you for uh, reminding us that this is not another year of Christmas that we will be able to get enough gifts, enough friends to celebrate with, visiting shops and enjoying the holidays. But God, this may be the only season where we can step in. Step into your grace and step out with your grace to disseminate darkness in the lives of others through the precious gifts that we have received from you. The love, joy, peace, forgiveness, and even salvation, Lord. The world is waiting for us, God, but we are not prepared. Sometimes we lend our ear, Lord, to Satan and his thoughts, like David did. May we listen to those hard things, difficult things that would please you rather than things that would make us happy so that we can participate in the advancement of your kingdom, Lord. God, if there is anyone here that is afraid of sharing those precious gifts with others, Lord, some people need to forgive their own family members. Some people need to forgive their friends in the office. Some people may need to forgive their colleagues or their friends in college. God, we wanted to go with those precious gifts of forgiveness, love, and joy so that they will have the greatest gift ever in their lives and turn to you, Lord. God, thank you for bringing all of us to that. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray.